A person's success at podcasting is really going to depend on a thorough understanding of what their goals are before they get started. And so one of the resources I offer actually, not just in the book, but on my website, if you go to the indieauthor.com and it's indie with a Y and you click on podcasting for authors, one of the resources is called the captain's log. Uh, so I created this captain's log that anyone can download. And it is the uh, summary of the questions that I ask at the end of each of the chapters in the book. So if you want the background, you can look at the book, but if you just want to see what the questions are, uh, you can download the captain's log. And so a lot of it is understanding what you're hoping to get out of it. Now, if you're hoping to get book sales, I'm not sure I could recommend podcasting for most, most authors if Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 216 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host. Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Maddie Dalrymple, podcaster, writer, and speaker on the writing craft and the publishing voyage as the indie author. And that's indie with a Y. She's the host of the Indie Author Podcast, the author of the Indie Author's Guide to Podcasting for Authors, which we talk about a lot here. My co-author on Taking the Short Tack, Creating Income, and Connecting with Readers Using Short Fiction, as well is the author of the Lizzie Ballard thrillers and the Anne Kinnear suspense novels. And that's coming up later in this episode. But first, here's a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. If you are looking for a professional narrator to narrate your audiobook and to distribute your audiobook to the world's largest distribution network for indie authored audiobooks more than 43 retailers and libraries look no further than findaway voices now i said and earlier but it could have been and or because if you already have your audiobook ready all you have to do is use findaway voices to load it you can select which platforms you want it to be loaded to you can send them to all or you can select which ones you want to go to I love that flexibility of Find Away Voices. I also love how they've continued to roll out new tools, new opportunities for authors with their audiobooks, such as the Marketplace, which they only recently announced, which is going to make it more like a marketplace like ACX, where instead of having to get locked into a project manager from Find Away Voices, where they're going to find you five to ten of the best possible narrators from their network of thousands of narrators, but they're opening it up so that narrators have an opportunity to put up their sign, uh, post a sign, basically put up their profile, put up their CV, and basically uh, allow people to uh, find them that way. So you'll have choices. You can work with a professional project manager. You can do it on your own, finding the right narrators. That's the great thing about Findaway Voices, is it's all about offering authors power and choice. And I'm all about power and choice. So if you want to see how you can leverage audiobooks as an indie author, check out Findaway Voices over at Stark Reflections dot ca slash find i'm just gonna do a quick personal update and it is related to something maddie and i talk about in the interview it is the self-publishing advice conference put on by the alliance of independent authors and it is two full days of amazing workshops from professionals from across the industry on the 23rd and 24th of october on the craft of writing You'll have such topics, just the first few in the first day. Crafting beautiful prose, how to plot a book if you've never plotted before, writing books for rapid release, writing for a cause, doing research well, writing great di dialogue, how to write emails that sell books, 
as well as the Craft of Writing Short Fiction Workshop by Maddie Dalrymple and myself. Now, this is free to watch for three days, so if you're listening to this as this episode goes out on October 22nd, you can get in there right away. If not, there is an option to register for an all-access pass, so you can watch the content whenever you want at your own convenience. And there'll be a link to that in the show notes over at starkreflections.ca. That's a pretty awesome uh, conference. The Alliance of Independent Authors does these amazing virtual conferences and have been doing them well before the pandemic forced most other people to be doing virtual conferences. And I love this because they're making it accessible to people from around the world, even if they can't travel to in-person events. And you have professionals and indie authors from across the indie author community, a veritable who's who of people in the indie author community, and several whom have been guests on this podcast teaching you their expertise. It's a phenomenal opportunity, and I do encourage you to check it out. Uh, We can always, all of us, become better at the craft of writing. And so that's it for the personal update. I'm going to skip the comments from recent episodes, although I do want to say thank you so much to so many of the folks who reached out based on comments from uh, last episodes, as well as the um, Patreon uh, episode that I put out where I was just kind of expressing my worry or my anxiety over um, uh, business practices uh, in the industry. In any case, I'm just keeping personal stuff and introduction short so we can get right into this interview with Maddie Dalrymple. Hey, Maddie, welcome back to the Stark Reflections podcast. It is fun to be here. Hello, Mark. <laughs> good. It's good to have you back on. I know we, we chat offline all the time, but it's good to back, have you back on for my guests. So a couple things I want to share. I know we're going to be talking about podcasting and audio for authors, but I wanted to say congratulations on the milestone 100th episode of the Indie Author Podcast. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. And guess who the uh, guess who the landmark episode guest was? That's a dad joke right there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was I was honored to be part of that. Thank you so much. There will of course be a link, obviously, to your podcast and the landmark episode 100. But um, so part of the celebration, the celebration continues, as I understand, with none other than the esteemed Orna Ross. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing with Orna since that episode where we chatted? Yeah, absolutely. So episodes 101 through 107 are going to be me and Orna talking about the seven processes of publishing. So let's see if I can get this editorial design, production, distribution, marketing, although I think it has a different name. And, uh, and because it's Orna Ross and the Alliance of Independent Authors, selective rights licensing is the seventh one. So it's going to be a great resource. I think it's going to be wonderful for people who are new to the area because it just walks through the seven processes of publishing. But I think it's going to be great even for old timers like us, because, you know, I would be talking with Orna and I would think I knew what I was doing in a certain area. And I realized I can always get new ideas or brush off ideas that I should have remembered from before when I listened to those things. So yeah, episodes 101 through 107 of the Indie Author Podcast will be Orna Ross. So is this based on a a book she's releasing or is it just, she's just, as she does, she's just trying to help authors? Well, a very good companion piece is the book that I think went out under Michael Ron's M.L. Ron uh, pen name. Um, Orna may have been a co-author on that, but it was put out via the Alliance of Independent Authors. It's called 150 Self-Publishing Questions Answered. So it's it's a great companion piece. You can listen to that podcast episode on design, for example, which covers book cover design and interior formatting. And then you can go to the 150 self-publishing questions answered. And if Orna and I haven't answered it in the podcast, then Michael will have answered it in the book. Wow. So uh, that's amazing. So Michael Aron, Orna Ross, you're hanging out with the royalty of independent publishing, aren't you? Yes, I am. Well, and I- makes you a princess? I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) I was super excited to- um, to have also been a part of the self pub con coming up where you and I are going to be talking about the craft of short fiction. Right. And that is coming up very shortly. We're recording yeah. this in um, late October, but it, isn't it coming up like in, in a few days? Uh, yes, it is coming up in a few days. And if people, well, this is probably not going to going to make sense. Uh, you know, the, the replays will be available if people purchase a 
Yeah, or if you're level. an Alliance of Independent Author member. I believe so. Yeah, I think you have access to it a little bit beyond the, the live. So yeah, because you and I partnered for something there, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Talking about the craft of short fiction. The craft of short fiction. That was a that was a uh, little stretch for both of us. Yeah, yeah. Because I, 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 I jokingly, I think I, I even said in the relaxed author, I, I purposely don't do craft things because who am I to tell you how to write? I, I learn writing from better people. <laughs> so uh, the, the yeah. challenge was sharing some of the things about the craft uh, rather than trying to help people. I guess, I don't know, become better writers. <laughs> they have to do that on their own with really great instructors. I'm just going to guide them. And uh, I think, yeah, we had a we had a bit of a challenge with that because I'm all about the business all the time, right? Right, right. And I think we both assumed when uh, Orna first approached us that it was going to be at the business of short fiction. But I think that if other people are like me, I enjoy listening to people talk about their own approach to the craft and can pick out uh, hopefully gems. And so that's what we tried to do in our in our segment. For sure. And I think one of the things that we did that I don't think either one of us was expecting that I thought was quite amazing was we came up with a writing assignment, right? The, the, what, was that, what do you call them? The Drabble. The drabble. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was thinking, is that a cartoon? <laughs> it does sound like a cartoon. I learned that from uh, Rand Walker, who was on a recent episode talking about how he uh, reimagined his indie author career through short fiction and um, he's a big fan of Drabbles, 100 words, 100 word short stories. Exactly, 100 words, which we we, we put out as an assignment, uh, which if yeah. people are checking that out, they will already know about. Um, I know. You, you'll, you'll share a link to that episode so I can make sure I call that one out in the, in the podcast. Yes, yes, I will. Notes. Awesome, thank you. So let's, now that we've caught up on some of the cool things we've had to get to do <laughs> together and, and the cool celebration that Orna is, uh, is working on you with, audio podcasting for authors so let's talk a little bit about like it so a lot of authors think okay I got to get into audiobooks I got to get into audio and and is podcasting I guess one of the first questions is is podcasting going to help me sell more books or why would an author want to get into podcasting to be to begin with yeah well we're talking uh based on the book I wrote uh the indie author author's guide to podcasting for authors and I uh, put that together based on my now 100 uh episodes of experience with the indie author, as well as being a podcast guest. There's a segment on being a, a good podcast guest as well. But as I look back over my own evolution of uh, my podcast, I realized I had learned a lot of lessons that hopefully I could uh, keep other people from having to learn in a painful way. And I think that a person's success at podcasting is really going to depend on a thorough understanding of what their goals are before they get started. And so one of the resources I offer actually, not just in the book, but on my website, if you go to the indieauthor.com and it's indie with a Y and you click on podcasting for authors, one of the resources is called the captain's log. And so as I am wont to do, I like to chips. <laughs> I, I like to tie everything into a nautical metaphor. That's and right. so throughout the indie author's guide to podcasting for authors, you can see it has like a little a little ship speaker there on the cover. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I love I love that you've got that consistent branding across your title. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I created this captain's log that anyone can download. And it is the uh, summary of the questions that I ask at the end of each of the chapters in the book. So if you want the background, you can look at the book. But if you just want to see what the questions are, uh, you can download the captain's log. And so a lot of it is understanding what you're hoping to get out of it. Now, if you're hoping to get book sales. I'm not sure I could recommend podcasting for most, most authors if um, book sales were their end goal. But for me, when I started out back in 2016, um, I was putting out occasional um, episodes of the Indie Author Podcast, and it was mainly me talking to people that I met through my local uh, writers groups who had some knowledge that I wanted. It would be either how to prepare for a reading or what can small press publishers do for you or how do you reach media outlets and things like that. And I basically was using it as a networking opportunity because I wanted an, an excuse to talk to these people. And then as my way of paying it forward, I was recording it usually in person at the time and I would make it available through the podcast. So, you know, I might put out a couple of episodes in a month and then I might go a couple of months without any episodes, but it was really um, a networking effort. And I am curious for you, uh, with the Stark Reflections, how did that start for you? What was your initial impetus for doing that? 
you, you can tell you're a podcast host because you just immediately jump on, <laughs> on, the, on the aggressive where you want to ask the questions, but I will, <laughs> because we're friends. I, I can't be on a podcast I with know. a podcaster and not talk about their podcast. But that, that exactly what you did there is exactly why I wanted uh, to, to run a podcast. So, you know, uh, I left Kobo at the end of 2017 and I had started the Kobo Writing Life podcast, you know, as a way to promote the platform and, and author, offer tips for authors. And whenever I did the interviews, I, I got Chrissy Monroe to help because I was I was only able to do it, you know, with my 60 hours a, a week <laughs> of work. I was able to fit it in here and there. So it was maybe one or two episodes a month if I was lucky. Uh, but then when Chris, uh, when I hired Christine Monroe, um, she was willing, no one else was willing to, to be on stage back then <laughs> and to be visible. She was willing to uh, pick it up. And, and you know, so we alternated episodes. So that, that helped out a lot. But when I left Kobo, I missed uh, having an excuse to talk to really smart people and learn. And, and what I did is uh, I actually, um, uh, what, there was just a few weeks between my announcing my leaving and my leaving the company, you know, just to get everyone up and running. You don't want to you know, rip the bandaid off as soon as possible. So there were still some outstanding things I was still working with Chrissy on after I left because I still had access to all these things and I was trying to you know, offload them to her. So it was a very, I mean, you still have a great relationship with Kobo. And one of the things I said is, listen, I left you in the lurch. I'd already recorded a couple interviews. Why don't I just produce those episodes and I'll give them to you? And as I was doing that on my own with more free time suddenly, because I, I dreamed that I would write full time. That was the, the thought. I realized I missed that work and I wanted to do it again. So after I finished those episodes, I thought, what the heck? I'm going to start my own podcast. So I planned it to start the first week of January 2018. So I had sort of a month and a bit to to plan things out and get get things up and running and i thought okay i'll do the same sort of format there'll be a bit of an introduction personal update whatever comments etc the main content which is the interview and most of them are interviews there are some solo episodes and then at the end i'm going to reflect on what i learned as an author because for me that's always been the critical part is what did i learn from talking to this person so just doing it is helping me and is helping my listeners so that was my excuse uh, to get into podcasting. I never dreamed that it would actually be something that would sell books. All it was was really an excuse for me to talk to smart people. Um, anything else that's come from it has been, in my mind, a, a bonus or a benefit, right? A sponsor approached me and said, hey, can we give you money for this? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, patrons have been so wonderful and generous as well. And some of the content, and thanks to you, uh, some of the content became books. Uh, so for example, I know we, we talked about short fiction uh, on the podcast and you reached out to me and that's where Taking a Short Tack came from. And similarly, I think you were one of the people who asked uh, about a special episode on working with libraries or working with bookstores. Uh, and I'm pretty sure it was you that reached out and asked that. And that ended up, I, I, I took that content and then that was the basis for the very first light draft of, of a book on the same topic. So I got book sales specifically related to the content. I don't think I, I would sell many of my fiction titles because I have a podcast, uh, except for the, the rare listener who thinks, wow, that sounds like a fun read, <laughs> right? right. Um, I don't count on those things. And I'm sure, is, that, is the same thing true for you? Yeah, I would say that the podcast probably sells is a necessary part of my promotion plan for my nonfiction books. So if I write a book on podcasting for authors, I better have a podcast, right? Like nobody's <laughs> going to read a podcasting for authors book that's not by an authorized podcast. And so it was kind of the necessary, it was uh, necessary, but not sufficient, as they say. So <laughs> it's a great to have that background. And of course, I wrote the book because of having that background. And I do have an opportunity to plug the book in my podcast periodically. Sometimes it's the featured affiliate, uh, my own books. Yeah. Um, and uh, similarly, because I'm speaking to writers and authors, I get to mention taking the short tack periodically in, in the appropriate circumstances. But it's not like I do a podcast episode on short fiction and suddenly there's a huge spike that has a long tail for, for the short fiction book. It's more... Uh, as with many of these in the author stream of income components, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's building over time. And so I would never spin up a podcast to, to uh, sell 
books, unless you already have a huge platform, I guess. I mean, I think people who already have a following are already celebrities. Uh, Of course, they could spin up a podcast to talk about the topic of a book and it could be very um, profitable for them. But I think that uh, there are only a very few people who are in that position. And so um, I don't think that it's it's primarily a sales and certainly not for, um, certainly not for fiction. So I do sometimes mention my fiction books on the podcast. I sometimes use them as examples. We've used them as examples for, for discussions of craft, uh, in the, in the interviews of the podcast. Enough since we have it. (laughs) I'm sorry. It's easy enough since we have easy access to that content. Exactly. (laughs) And I can pretty sure be pretty sure I'm not going to get in trouble for a rights violation. Um, but I do think that the fiction is an even tougher, um, it's even tougher to justify a podcast for fiction. And having been a guest on some fiction related podcasts, my theory about this, and I actually tested it out with a couple of other old podcasting hands like Jay Thorne, um, who's done all sorts of podcasts based on both fiction and nonfiction. And we both agreed that fiction was an even tougher sell for sales um, because my feeling is that probably if I appear as a guest on a fiction podcast, I'm probably picking up a certain number of people who are fans of that podcast, fans of, of the people who host that podcast. But mainly, I think it's people who already know me following me to that podcast and maybe not sticking around for it. So in terms of the podcast host, I appreciate what they're doing in terms of helping me get word out about my books and also providing me with some fodder for social media, if I can use excerpts from it, but it's not really sales related. I think you have to love it, love doing it for the sake of the interactions you can have, um, at least when you start out as you, as was the case for you. I mean, and maybe it's, it's, it's a conduit for you to communicate with your fans because someone else has a podcast and they're hosting it, they're producing it, and your fans can go, you can say, hey, I'm going to be on so-and-so's podcast, and your fans yes. are excited because they go, oh, I love Maddie's uh, books. Right. Yeah, so, the, so the, it's kind of like it allows you an op- a conduit to, to talk to your readers. Can you talk about, because <laughs> uh, I know, I know I've, I've leveraged this, and I'm sure you have as well, having a podcast has that given you opportunities to connect with individuals that you've wanted to connect with? That you ever, like leverage Absolutely. That, <laughs> that was the primary, um, one of the primary reasons I continued it. So a couple of years ago, I was really feeling bogged down by the administrative side of doing the podcast and I was considering giving it up. And then um, I was listening to Joanna Penn talk about audio, the importance of audio and the importance of podcast I know I'm, I'm not saying that she said this, but I see it as sort of like the next generation of blogging, you know, blogging was a thing for a while. Now I think podcasts are achieving in some ways, the same things, but, but enabling you to reach goals beyond as well. But I had my list of, of dream guests and uh, I've, I've worked through many of them and I'm not even going to say names because I know I would leave off a, yeah you know, one would feel horrible, but yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll use a good example that one of my favorite authors is uh, Ben Winters. So Ben Winters wrote the uh, the Last Policeman series, which is uh, the basis for an upcoming, I believe it's still upcoming movie or series called The Last Police. They changed the name because the now the protagonist was a woman um, and uh, wrote uh, Underground Airlines, it just wrote a bunch of my favorite books. And I got in touch with Ben Winters and um, said, you know, Ben, I have a podcast. Would you, would you be willing to come on and talk to me about um, the, the bothness of compelling characters? Because I loved his characters because the protagonists were deeply flawed and the bad guys were empathetic and interesting. You know, he, he did, in my opinion, um, a genius job of creating those well-rounded characters. And so he said, yeah, so I got to spend, you know, an hour chatting with one of my favorite authors and I can just expand that to all the people that I look up to for business advice, for craft advice. Uh, it has been a great, um, a great entree to doing that. Oh, that is cool. So I, I guess the, the next question I want to ask is, okay, so you've got the idea, you've got the concept for a podcast. Um, what, what do you need in terms of material? What do you need in terms of technology in order to to make this happen 
Well, it's getting easier and easier. Um, I actually didn't put much, if at any, if any information in the book about technology because it's changing so quickly. And well, no specific uh, platforms, but I mean, you need yes. you need an RSS feed. How do you like any of those? Right. Things? Yeah, you would need the uh, a way to record a, a way to record the yeah. um, interview, or if it's a solo effort, uh, a way right. to do that. Uh, some tool that you would use for editing, you need to be able to, as you say, get it up on some platform. I happen to use Libsyn, there are others as well. Um, and that's really it. But the technology is such that things that even a year ago, even six months ago, I might have um, called out as necessities like a sound treated room. So you can see the room that I'm sitting in now to talk with you is my is my guest setting. So I have an office and I have two directions. If if you were to look, be able to look that way, you would see the background that people would recognize from the Indie Author podcast. And then this is this is my slightly more interesting background for when I'm nautical a guest. Nautical maps on the wall behind you. The nautical <laughs> maps on the wall behind me. The, uh, the owl is a leftover from when I did the Zoom uh, launch for one of the Ann Kinner books, which was called The Falcon and the Owl. But you can see I have this kind of uh, right. grass, uh, uh, what is this called? The uh, uh, divider, yeah, a room divider. Yeah, a divider, yeah. And the curtains behind me and so on. But honestly, some of the audio and video editing software now is so good at taking out background noise um, and, and modulating the audio that, you know, pretty soon you're just going to be able to like sit in a Starbucks and record a podcast. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Like the directional microphone too is not going to pick up yeah. the ambient noise as, as much depending on the settings. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I think that the other um, the, the other thing I'd say that I don't see changing anytime real soon is just not using your uh, the built-in mic in your computer. So I'm using um, a Blue Yeti microphone. I'm I have uh, earbuds in so that you know my computer the audio isn't picking up your response, um, and it makes makes for cleaner audio. And you know, so you make an investment of I don't know twelve bucks or something like that <laughs> for <laughs> even for a, a wired mic that has a, a microphone built in, and um, and you're good to go there. So yeah, I think that the the technical hurdles are very small. It's more the content hurdles that are the challenge to get over, and making right. sure you've thought through what you want to achieve with your podcast. You know that what's your destination? Right. How are you going to navigate to your destination? And then getting more tactical. Who do you want to talk to? What are the types of people you want to talk to? What are the types of topics that you want to cover so that you don't get to episode three and say, okay, that's, I, you know, now I'm dry. Don't have anything else there. <laughs> have you ever had trouble coming up with topics for your podcast? Never. Never. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the problem is um, I don't have enough time to do all the things I want to do. That's one of the problems because the next question I was going to ask you was, um, the time it takes to produce a podcast. You're a writer. You've got books to produce. You've got fans waiting for the next one. And yet you're spending this time on a podcast. Um, how much time does it take out of an average week for you? I would say it probably takes about 10 hours a week. And, and that is, some of it that is time consuming is fun, like the interview. That's and even listening part. back to the interview. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, you spend 45 minutes, an hour on that, then you spend the time listening back to it. Because as you and I have talked about, oftentimes, there's a period of time between when you record an episode and when it airs. And so sometimes I'm recording an episode, and then not getting to editing it for a couple of months. And I need to either do that or listen to it before I record my personal update, which I try to do as close to when the episode is going to air as possible. And that's all the fun stuff. But the thing that I've really struggled with is transcription. And I feel like at, at first it was, yes. um, it was something I was doing sort of to hopefully take advantage of SEO. So I put a transcript of the, of the podcast up on the mm -hmm. website. I don't understand SEO enough to, un right. You put a yeah, it's, it's pretty clean. Website. I've had people say, oh, that reads much more like an article than the transcripts I'm used to seeing. And, um, and there's a 
there's a time price to pay for that. I spend a ton of time on the transcript transcript, and I'm always looking for ways to reduce the time I'm spending on it because at some point, you know, I do a pass right. uh, in, in Descript, which is the tool that I use for editing the podcast, which is great because I have no audio or video editing background and Descript is a tool that enables you to edit the transcript. So it automatically generates the transcript. And then, uh, you know, if I get a frog in my throat and I have to say, oh, excuse me, just let me get a drink of water. It will render that in the transcript. And then if you cut out that text, it cuts it out of the audio and video. So it's, if you can edit a word document, then you can edit audio and video using Descript. And the transcripts are pretty good, but not polished. And at some point, once I've done things like clipping out the references to needing to get a drink of water or, you know, the UPS guy comes to the door, the cat walks across the keyboard or, you know, I've done those big edits, then all the subsequent edits are just very mechanical and right. I'm not bringing any added value to that effort. And so I've experimented with different approaches. I actually um, just started paying somebody that I met through um, a Descript user community to do an hour of editing because I'm trying to make the podcast pay for itself and I don't have enough income coming from it. Maybe we can talk about the income aspect, but you know, I don't have a ton of money to sink into it. So I said, just do whatever you can in an hour. And he's doing more in an hour than I would be able to do in an hour. So it's saving me that time. Um, But it is one of those things over time, I've realized the two other big benefits in addition to SEO are that if I put clips up on social media, they're captioned because the transcript also uh, is usable as captions using Descript and which is great because if someone's scrolling through their Facebook or their Twitter feed, they might not notice a still from a video, but if the video is playing and they can see the text or if they're in an environment where they really can't play the audio, then I'm appealing to them. I'm obviously uh, appealing to people who, um, you know, need the captioning, uh, because of a hearing impairment. Um, but if I were, if I hadn't set the expectation about providing a transcript, I would really rethink it. Although I've, I periodically poll the people who follow the podcast and say, are you reading it? Are you listening to it? And a surprising number of people are reading it. So it's one of those things, every time the, the logistics of podcasting come up, I always groan about the transcript, but it's serving a pool of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to access that information in audio or YouTube form. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point. And, and I actually, when I run out of time, which happens every week, I often, well, what can I cut? Well, don't necessarily have to have a transcript. Yeah. I, I know there is a small percentage of people that um, have actually, and, and occasionally I have a listener, Rick, hey, is there a transcript to this? Yeah. And then I'll go back and do it. Because if someone asks, then I'm like, well, if you want it, it's not that hard. It'll only take me an hour. Because yeah. again, I don't clean it up apart from a couple things at the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I just, again, I, I don't, the podcast costs me in time more than I make. Yeah. And I'm not saying that to be whiny or complaining. So I have to do, give the, the best possible product I can without sacrificing where I actually make income. Because if I spent all my time on that, then I would not be able to eat or, or pay for the mortgage or any of those things. So that's one of the things that I, I struggle with is that balance. Yeah. Um, can we talk a little bit about the money side of the podcast it's an obviously it's an investment of time even if you can get some help right with this Mm -hmm. hour here and hour there yeah it is a significant you said 10 hours a week yeah Uh, that's 10 hours you could be writing or marketing or something else so what what's the money situation like uh, from your perspective well i do hope to make it a money-making venture at some point And uh, the creating income side of it is something I do talk about in the book. And so there are, there are direct income opportunities, like you had mentioned sponsorships after a couple of marginally successful attempts at sponsorships, I've decided to go with the uh, featured affiliate route because in both cases, it's sort of a, this episode is brought to you by a kind of scenario. And of course you have to make it clear whether it's a sponsorship or an affiliate, but I find I kind of like the affiliate approach because it's easy for me to tie 
the affiliate that I sponsor that I feature for a certain episode in with the topic. And so, for example, there's these seven episodes with uh, Orna from the Alliance of Independent Authors. I'm a happy member of the Alliance of Independent Authors. You can join the Alliance through my affiliate link. And so my featured affiliate for all those episodes is no doubt going to be Ally. Or if I'm right. doing one on book formatting, uh, you know, I'm an affiliate of Vellum and so I can feature those. And so it gives me ultimate flexibility. And then if I fall out of love with something, it's no problem for me to stop recommending it to people. And right. so the, the direct income I'm making from the podcast are, are from affiliate sales, a small amount, but one I hope to grow over time. Um, and then um, patronage. So uh, I have a, a Patreon account. I have a uh, buy me a coffee. So the way I position those is I, I position Patreon as the route that people can take if they want to, um, you know, have a regular ongoing contribution of $1, $3 per month. And then buy me a coffee. I position as if you want to make an occasional contribution to indicate the value that a specific episode of resource provided to you. <laughs> Can you tell I've said right. these a couple of times? Then yeah. I point them to buy me a coffee. And both of those platforms, Patreon and buy me a coffee, offer the other approach. But I I feel it's beneficial for people very clearly to know, oh, I want to do this on an ongoing basis. I'm going to go to Patreon. I want to do it on an occasional basis. I'm going to go to buy me a coffee. Right. One is like leaving you a tip and the other one is kind of like, a, I, I want to subscribe exactly. to continually give you a bit of cash. Yeah. Yeah. And so far, actually, Buy Me a Coffee has proven more profitable for me than uh, than Patreon, but I'm hoping that over time to change that. And then the other direct income opportunity that I did not anticipate is that someone approached me about uh, someone who was starting a podcast and said, do you do consulting? It's like, I do now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've been consulting with this person and it's not something that I'm advertising widely, except for announcing it to all your listeners, but it's, it's a great, it's both a great, another little stream of income, but also hearing the questions that he has and the conversations we have, I can imagine being input to, you know, maybe the indie author's guide to podcasting for authors version too. Um, right, so right. it's always nice to, to have that kind of interaction with someone and having it uh, just be a, a small number of people is useful. So all that to say, you know, all those things are helping to support uh, paying for the monthly Libsyn fee, paying for my monthly Descript subscription, but it is in no way approaching paying me back for the time I'm spending on it. Right. And so that's something that that's sort of my top business dilemma now is um, the podcast is the thing that I'm doing that has the least immediate and measurable financial impact. I'm right. trying to do this as a living. And you're absolutely right that uh, what I probably should be doing is writing another novel. Um, <laughs> but it's because I love the podcast process that I'm not giving it up. Yeah, and that's what I was going to ask you is, so why? Why are you doing it if it's something that is the investment is far outweighing right now, right? Yeah. I, and I know you think long-term, I, I recognize that. Mm -hmm. So that's probably part of it, but you, you actually get a benefit out of it an intrinsic value right away, I imagine, right? Yeah, well, it's really exactly what you were saying before. Like, you know, you get an opportunity to talk to your heroes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there've been plenty of times when uh, I'm thinking back to an episode I did with Brian Meeks. Brian does book descriptions. Uh, product descriptions for, you know, sales pages. And I said, would you do an episode with me? And at the end, you'll get to plug your, your product description service, but would you be willing to overhaul one of my book descriptions as an exercise for the episode? And he was happy to do it. And so, you know, he left that with a plug with audio and video he could use to promote his product. And I left it with a professionally buffed up product descriptions. And your listeners got to see his work in action to understand yes. what he's able to do for people, which is a great plug too, obviously. Yeah. And I, it would, I rely on you to bring, bring these kinds of things up, but the other big benefit is the opportunity to pay it forward to other people in the, in the author community. And these people right. are, uh, that I'm interviewing are willing to give up half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, sometimes more of their time to talk with me and then making that those insights, that knowledge available to other people is 
um, gratifying. Cool, because then you become the conduit for yeah. uh, people to find out about these guests that you have, whether they're readers, whether they're uh, writers listening, you know, to learn more about the business and the yeah. craft, et cetera. Cool. Well, Maddie, thank you so much for sharing your insights again uh, with my listeners. Can you please uh, let everyone know where we can find out more about you, about your podcast, about your books, and obviously about this latest book that you've just released? Yes. Yeah, so it is um, the Indie Author's Guide to Podcasting for Authors. And if you want to find out about that or the book I co-wrote with Mark, Taking a Short Tack about creating income and reaching readers with short fiction, you can go to the indieauthor.com and that's indie with a Y, I-N-D-Y. And if you want to find out about my fiction, you can go to maddiedalrymple.com and that's Maddie and Dalrymple, both with Ys, M-A-T-T-Y. Very consistent. Yes. Then you'll be able to get to all my social media platforms and other offerings from those. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maddie. Thank you, Mark. This was so much fun as always. There are a few things I wanted to reflect on uh, based on the interview. The first thing is Maddie's nautical theme and the consistent branding that she uses for that theme. So it's kind of like uh, the phrase she used, such as something like, how do you want to navigate to your destination? The idea of the captain's log, the taking the short tack, the title of the book we co-authored. I mean, I love the consistency of the branding, and it's something that's personally precious and important to her. And she's incorporated that in to her author brand. I do the same thing with my writer side, not the not the business of writing and publishing side, but the writer side with the skulls and the skeletons and all of those things. Again, it's that consisting, consistent branding that uh, you want to think about. So obviously, anytime I hear nautical terms, I'm like, oh, that's the that's the indie author brand, um, or the you know indie author podcast, the the whole thing that uh, Maddie runs. So that that's the first thing I wanted to reflect on because it's it can be a subtle thing, but can actually be a powerful thing in the long run. The second is is sort of two things together. The first is the intrinsic motivation of the podcast, as opposed to thinking, okay, I'm going to sell a lot of books, or I'm going to make money off the podcast via sponsorships, patrons, etc. It's the intrinsic motivation that drives most of us podcasters forward. It's the engaging with the community. It's getting to talk to really awesome people and getting to hear from really awesome people like you who leave comments. And, and, and that's for me, a huge reward. And I know that's part of the reward for Maddie, but in in conjunction with that is the long-term thinking. She reached 100 episodes. Most podcasts, 13, I think is the average, anywhere between 5 and 13 episodes, and she's stuck it out for the long run. Like many podcasters, I think she started off um, semi-regularly. I remember that's how I started the Cobo Writing Life podcast off too. And it wasn't until we moved it to a weekly that it became consistent. And, and that's why I launched and wanted to stay weekly and haven't haven't missed a week since. Speaking of which, there's probably going to be a bonus episode coming uh, before next week because I just can't help myself. I have so many great interviews I want to share with you and I don't want to leave them in the, in the can or on the back burner for too long. But it's that long-term thinking that I think is really an important aspect uh, for authors in general, whether you're traditionally published, whether you are an indie author. And I think that is really, really valuable. So that's it for my reflections for this episode. And I'm about to wrap up this episode. As I teased, I will probably be sharing yet another conversation that I recently had during a live broadcast. And I'll be sharing that as a between episode. So there will be uh, another um, couple episodes before the end of the best month of the year, October, because it's Halloween. Who knows? Maybe I'll even sneak in an extra scary one. I, I haven't done that to you guys yet, have I, in the three years of the podcast? But you never know. There could be a tricky treat in there somewhere. But this is the end of the episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to support the podcast, you can leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. That always helps. You can share the podcast with someone that you think would find great value in it. You can also become a patron over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. And 
inspired by Maddie, I created a buy me a coffee and I'm going to include a link to that in the show notes at Stark Reflections as well. Because again, I recognize maybe maybe you want to say, hey, thanks and just throw a dollar a tip into the bucket, but you don't want to be committed to, you know, twelve dollars, one dollar a month for a year or whatever. Uh, and, and I'm going to look at seeing if I can come up with additional rewards uh, for that. But uh, thank you so much. Because again, I'm willing to experiment. And of course, I'll, I'll let you, dear listeners, know how things like that are going. And so, until next episode, which is probably going to be before next week, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.